I'm still muted, sorry. Hi, sorry, helps when you're not muted. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to episode 9 of the GM Postmortem. Uh, what's going on, Lydia? How you doing? Hello, everyone. I'm doing fine. I had a day full of cat goodness. I am relaxed. Cat I'm goodness. Do, do tell. All the, well, there was a cat, and it was good. Um, <laughs> Checks out. <laughs> I'm happy to chat with uh, someone I've been uh, in contact with behind the scenes because of my own game that I'm jamming on Weekly Tale. And I'm happy to have Chris Drew here today, and I can't wait to break that... his brain apart and look at what is inside. That was gory and unnecessary, but here we are. I oh okay so hmm. hmm I was still back on the cat thing. Like we we I feel like we breezed right past the cat. And yes, we breeze past the cat, because if you get me going about cats, we'll be here for half an hour. I should have the cat filter ready. Or also known as the lawyer filter, of course, which works for me. Yeah. That 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 is... We should not do that. That is absolutely silly, and, you know... As you queue up snap camera. Yeah, I was looking at it. No, I'm so, not going to do that. That's well, a cheap it's, joke. It How is cool. Put, that... Put Ori in front of the camera because I will melt into a puddle. I have no. She is sitting on top of a stack of books at the moment. Um, she might come RPG by. RPG books. I have a book. They are. She loves to sit on my RPG books, but I have an RPG book sitting on my desk that she might be attracted to come sit on. But I hope not because it is relevant to what we're talking about. Oh, uh, full transition. I know. Um, but it's cool. Hey, one of your favorite uh, games currently. What with Great American Witch at all. One of my favorite games because. This is badass. Uh, both written by the uh, same wonderful fellow, Christopher Gray, who is patiently waiting for us to bring him in right now. So let's make him wait no longer, shall we? You bring him in. Hello. <laughs> oh, that, and hello, that's... puppy. <laughs> I, I think the dog wants to be on too, so I'll I'll go get him real quick. Mm -hmm. We appreciate stream dogs and stream cats and all the stream pets in, in all ways, shapes, and forms. I can throw all the stream pets at you. You know, just, please, just name it. Please do. I will steal them all. I will give them a good life. Um, Tara might be a little bit jealous, but that's fine as long as she, has, she gets food. Yeah, we'd probably it. get good viewership if it was just an entire stream of just a ton of cute animals. <laughs> yeah, parading why are we even here? Yeah, who cares? Yeah. Who cares about us? Games? <laughs> this is now officially a cute animal show. We're cute. We're cute. You know, I can't compete with you two. I'll try. Oh, stop it. <laughs> Thank oh, you so much for having me on. This is awesome. Yeah, man. Thank you for joining us. Um, we've we've been, yeah, I, I mention it briefly. I've been uh, chatting with you before just a little bit about Great American Witch, um, which I've been having a lot of fun with on Weave the Tale this season. And from what I could tell, correct me if I'm wrong, um, one of the main things that we connected over and that is important to you as well when it comes to your games is the narration focus and the narrative focus rather than the mechanics which of course suits us all quite quite fine here uh nothing against chunky games but uh it's just what we prefer doing so is is that something you've always been here for is that something that was always the main draw for you of ttrpgs well, I mean, I like chucking dice like anybody. I, I am, you know, a fan of the crunchier systems. I actually come from that world, but um, I'm also a storyteller. And so often with some of the more traditional games, I find myself a little bit, um, I don't know, trapped uh, in the confines of the mechanics when really what I want to do is tell a story. Now, there are definitely people, uh, and myself included, that will play games for the game, but um, I, I like to play... Uh, out stories and I, I think one of the things that affects me the most about role-playing games is this ability to create such a a cool shared experience like you can't get this from novels or films or any other sort of storytelling medium this sort of um shared uh the shared power of stories um and and there's something very primal about it that i really connect with so when i design i'm always looking for ways to allow the story to come first and the game mechanics that comes second. It also uh, helps me uh, compensate for the fact that I'm terrible at game rules. Are you really? <laughs> I forget my own rules. I, it's terrible. I just, I get so into the you're, moment. You're terrible at retaining game rules? Is that part of the problem? Yes. Yeah, fair enough. 
I'm like that too. That's why I make you them know up. what I design them and that's fine. But once I've designed them, I forget about them or I do them wrong. And I actually have to study uh, my own games before I run them because I forget how they work. I think that's why I was so attracted to um, PBTA and still am. And like in my own like game design, I've been drawn to designing within PBTA because it's, it's just hard to forget the rules to a PBTA game because it's the same mechanic for everything pretty much. Uh, you'd be surprised. I still have to study. I, I'm running masks this weekend, and um, I, I still have to look it up at, 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 before the game and say, wait. That's got a few more work? moving parts, <laughs> but I I still just make it up most of the time anyway. It's like yeah, don't, No one knows. As long as the players don't know, then whatever you say are the rules are the rules. It's fine. Just make it up. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we'll go with that. I remember yeah. that phone call when one of the first things you said was, Let, don't worry about the rules, and I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> okay this is gonna be fine um well i worry about the rules in as much as it, is it getting in your way you know and i i did i think i talked to you about this too i did see somebody running witch that um that stumbled over it and and i was i was in the screen saying no no there's a rule for that you don't have to worry um and 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 so i'm concerned in that way like it shouldn't ever get in the way or there should be a tool if you need it mm. yeah it's uh, interesting for for Great American Witch in particular when reading through it that a lot of the rules and the mechanic um, explanations because I feel like that's what m many books do is when they try and give you the rules it's you know it's it's an aid it's it's a help for the GM on how to handle situations that's what they're supposed to be they're not you know this is a wall you can run into and no further they're helping you facilitate the game so. Um, the interesting thing for me was that a lot of the mechanics are geared towards helping someone tell a story with um it feels to me again let me know if you had something different in mind but to someone who is maybe not quite so familiar with storytelling giving them the little ins and outs of what the different chapters are used for the different elements of a story and how it can all be put together that was something quite new um, I've never really experienced it that way in an RPG to really focus on the storytelling through mechanics. Yeah, I, I think the design goal there was to um, you know, give you all the tools you needed to do it. And I think that the reason it's so explicit in Witch is because uh, it's expecting more traditional players to play. And so trying to segue people from, say, you know, vampire or mage or something uh, to, because it's the same people probably that are going to be playing. Mm. into a game that doesn't really use the rules in that way and it like you go into the indie game world and the um story game world as it's called these days it, this stuff is pretty pervasive i mean we you, we, we i've played games where all we do is just talk and you know and, and that's and that's the whole game it, it's some mm. of my favorite games i never roll dice. No, mm. there are no dice at all like mm. dialect comes to mind where it's just index cards as you're kind of just got my copy is. of that it just came in the mail oh, it's such a good game it's one of my favorites it's one of the um, most interesting i've ever seen it's wild so people coming from that world are, are going to be pretty comfortable in here, and they're, and they're going to like probably what it says, but they don't really need it. Um, I think people probably in, in your world that it's accustomed to, to taking the trad rules and just making it more cinematic in, at the table uh, probably doesn't need it either. But, but really it was explicit because of the uh, traditional player that's coming in attracted to the content, but may not be used to the tool sets. Mm. Yeah, that, that, that's pretty much the vibe I got from that as well, because again i was like oh i need to make sure this and, and what can i do in which exact chapter and this one i can use magic in this one I'm like fuck it it's just it it i i know exactly the basic um building blocks i am given here and i know enough not to be confined by them but just empowered by them so yeah. we, we had a little bit of the session 0 0.5 where we're like how does this exactly work and then you know it'll work however we want it to work mm -hmm. um yeah that is always such a relief when you know that's what the game designer had in mind as well and the machinery doesn't really translate very well to stream i ran um a, a campaign on the happy jacks rpg network and I think I saw Golden Lasso Girl in there. Um, yep, Golden Lasso Girl's here. Yep. Hi. Um, and and I found a struggle of trying to translate the mechanics to the stream uh, because of things like chapter structure. And for those of you who haven't read the book, uh, the the game is structured in chapters, and each chapter actually has different mechanical qualities. 
um, and the chapters are sort of like a menace chapter might be the the witches are under attack whereas a, a mundane chapter is the witches are just you know going to the store um and so the, but, but that that kind of that kind of setup is a little tricky on streams, and so you almost have to uncouple in order to make the story shine over over the mechanics. But when you had a table and you have your index cards out, um, that meta actually works pretty well. Mm. It is. Uh, you mentioned it is based on the Great American Novel uh, with the chapters and with the again narration focus as well, right? Yeah, yeah. The Great American Novel is actually created because I wanted. Uh, a game that focused on character motivations and not on plot or action mm -hmm. and um and and i couldn't find anything like that well it, actually there was a step beyond that i wanted a, a framework that would work in any genre and um and and so great american witch is the next iteration is sort of taking that framework and taking it over to this genre but i have others in other genres the uh the but it was always about you know i i don't we, yeah we can have car chases yeah we can have combat we can have all that stuff but that's not the focus of the purpose the purpose is how does a character change and why and that's um and that that's that frame, framework definitely feeds which that's the focus there too yeah the various actions being all very motivation based um for those who don't know Great American Witch, um, it is the basis of your rolling is PBTA. So you have your two to six plus one of three stats that are being added. Um, but things like kick some ass, it, there is a leash out, but it's it's all very interaction based. Uh, all the various moves are, are are I wouldn't say all dialogue based, but there's always it, it, they, all of them happen in a situation with other characters, NPCs. Um, rarely is there one that is that is purely solipsistic and purely focused on one person, and that already puts you in such a different mindset. Um, yeah, it's it's really interesting to run. Yeah, you have to ask why you're doing something, not what. So if you, know, I want to slap this person in the face, and that you know normally a game would say, well, did you hit them or not? Mm. And uh, <laughs> which doesn't ask that question. It asks why are you slapping them in the face? Well, it's because uh, they have insulted my pride. And, uh, you know, and so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to lash out. That's why. Or, or maybe it's because um, I'm protecting somebody else's pride and what they said about them. And so, so now in, in that case, I'm, I'm doing a moral stand or something else. And then, so, so the stats change based on why you're doing it, not what you're doing. Yeah. We've had a couple of questions in chat as well. Colin, you've been keeping track of them. Hi, huh? chat. I should probably look at that. I don't have my glasses on, so <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. Uh, yeah, I yeah. gathered a couple. I'll grab the. Uh, oh, we've got a third one that just came in from Golden Lasso Girl, actually. Um, so first one we got here is from our friend Anna, uh, who asked, uh, "What method for arbitrating randomness, dice cards, etc., do you draw upon most when designing narrative games, and why do you choose that in particular?" So I've no I have noticed this is an interesting one because it's um, I've noticed in the last couple of years that card draws become more popular. That seems to have taken off a bit, um, and there seems to be a general recognition that like randomness is randomness, and like any way you generate it is fine. It doesn't like it can be a random number. You can draw from a hat. It doesn't flip a coin. Doesn't fucking matter. There's really anything you can do. Um, but so it's what's fun to what i've seen in game design is that it's fun to play with that because some methods of generating while it's all basically the same because it's just generating random numbers and that's insofar as that um certain methods of doing it do actually have uh kind of cinematic implications i guess if you're flipping it like i think i feel like rolling a die versus laying out five cards in a table and having to choose one there's a different amount of tension that goes into that and stuff um, so I can see the different uh, pros and cons of different methods. So what is your what is your favorite or the one that you draw most upon in designing narrative games? I think the uh, game of operation would be the best randomizer. Opera but, oh, shit. Um, I just I mean, just had that idea. That would be awesome. <laughs> hey, um, I was... Oh, sorry, chaotic story to subscribe. I just wanted to thank them. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> That's wild. A game of operation. <laughs> uh, I, I think you're right. Randomizers uh, are can be anything, but not all randomizers are created equal. Even yeah. within dice, it's, it's true too. There's huge debates about um, about even what dice arrays should be should you be using in a game. Um, and I, I think my favorite, if I had to pick a favorite, I, I think it's dice, just because it's most versatile. 
Mm. Um, but I do like uh, other interesting ones. For example, uh, Dread and Starcrossed, who use Jenga. Jenga is a really cool tension building kind of randomizer. Um, cards are great. Uh, Golden Lasso Girl did Decima, which is one of my favorite world building uh, games, which uses a tarot deck. And that's awesome. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, and that's great, too. I, and I'm, I'm even played with the idea of casting bones as a randomizer and, and kind of doing it. And I actually have a game in the works where I'm trying to make that work. But um, but dice are, are the easier. But the dice is kind of a, it's kind of a touchy subject because when you're not touchy, but varied, because when, you, when you're doing the D20 model, it's very swingy. Is that yeah. the experience you want? Do you want lots of failure? <laughs> do you want, do you, or do you want your heroes to succeed a lot? And if they're succeeding too much, is it boring? Um, Powered by the Apocalypse gets a lot of heat, I think, from trad players because the uh, the swing is more on the fail side. Uh, because trad players will look at um, a, a six or less or a mixed result as a failure, not a full success. Mm. And um, but PBTA logic drives that home. Where it's like, no, there are two narratives going. There's the, the narrative you want and the narrative you didn't expect. And 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 because in trad games, when you fail, it's over. Yeah, it's binary. In PBTA games, you uh, you know you you move into a different story track. So. Uh, I guess the long answer to that question is I like to play with um, how dice arrays can can influence the type of narrative. Like when we when we look at um, Great American Witch, uh, there should be a lot of tension. So there's going to be a lot of failure in a trad sense, but it's actually what it is. There's going to be lots of different stories that you didn't expect. Yeah. But there's also ways to control that. See, the thing is, since it's so story based, there's there's currency that allows players to take narrative control of the outcome so that they can have buy-in over what happens. We're more concerned about the story than on character winning and losing. And ultimately when you're doing a story-driven game, that's the point, isn't it? I mean, you don't want a character to win all the time and it isn't about winning and losing, it's about change. And so, and so that's, that's, the, that's what the dice should propel. It should be failing a lot so that the character changes. Yeah, the whole kind Temples of- and Tombs, the new game I'm doing on the other hand, yeah. uh, is about heroes and heroes should fail all of the time. Um, but that failure needs to be awesome all of the time. Yeah, and so, cool you know, fail forward awesomeness. Yeah. yeah, so there's lots of dice mechanics in there about, you know, yeah, you, uh, you, you have a setback and that setback is hilarious and let's run with it, you know? And, mm-hmm. and so, yeah, I think the dice, it, be, before you determine what randomizer you should use, you should determine what the randomizer is going to accomplish for this particular game and why. Mm. Yeah, and it's, it is actually fun because I've done this in my own work of taking the time to sit down and do the math. I do actually find this kind of entertaining, even though I'm terrible at math, but thankfully any dice.com exists and will do this stuff for you and actually seeing the effect of how your mechanics are swinging the, the odds. And like, you know, in a game I was working on, we had a, uh, it's, it's 2d, uh, 2d 10, which I took from uh, cult divinity lost does that, but you know, it's PBTA based, but with 2d 10 instead of 2d six. And it's like advantage versus disadvantage system is, uh, 3d10 drop the lowest or 3d10 drop the highest depending on what you what you have basically and that that one little thing does a massive swing in your odds if you're if you have 3d10 uh 3d10 drop the highest you suck like you're gonna fail like 70 percent of your rolls basically with that and it's cool to look at how those little tweaks of mathematics can affect the kind of story you tell because if you do want to weight it toward failing you can you can do that uh and you know, and it's just a different way of looking at it. As you said, it's like, um, is is failing binary or is failing just some new interesting stuff is going to happen? And that's the way yeah. the way I look at it. I love, fa- yeah. I mean, I, I love messing up in PBTA games, especially. Right. But yeah, because failing can't make the player feel bad. I mean, that's, yeah. I think, what draws people away from trad games because you get so frustrated by missing the die roll. Um, and, and I think there's ways to improve that even in trad systems. Uh, you know, I don't know why we haven't come up with something for D&D where, you know, here is the consequence of getting of missing. Mm. You know, that, that's interesting you know, more than just I missed. You yeah, know. I did not yeah. do it. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think that it, as long as the player feels okay with losing, then losing isn't bad. And you do that by, by making losing another track to play. Mm. I think it probably comes from the war game background because, yeah, losing in this case is bad because it is a bad loss. Dies. Or <laughs> because, yeah, someone dies. It's, it's, it's what war game background does. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it kind of weights the game towards that sensation and towards those values almost. 
um, DBTA has always felt a little bit more, yeah, storytelling value, and that has been translated by all the other DBTA-based systems that have come after. Um, I've, I've, I've mostly been a D and D GM um, until recently, until a couple of one shots here in College Server, and yeah, of course, uh, Great American Witch. I've always done the storytelling aspect, like what you mentioned at the beginning. We've had D and D games with two roles in them. In the it, two roles in a three hour session, yeah, Maybe. yeah. <laughs> we've we've done that <laughs> a lot. Yeah, but um, I can I can really appreciate being fairly new to it, the um, the automatic hint it gives you towards add a caveat. Just a, that little caveat that you weren't mm -hmm. thinking of until just now. It just keeps things interesting. Um, yeah. yeah, I think but, you're right what you say about values. The Because, uh, you know, if you're playing D&D &D to tell a story, that's that's great. Um, the, the, the rules are going to get in the way of that. You know, uh -huh. you, you have to you have to kind of work around it or come up with something to change. But, you know, sometimes you just want to check dice and take names, and that's great. And there's some cool, cool systems for that. And, if you, you know, and it's, it, I, I sometimes want that. I don't always want to play story games. Um, and so when I do play more like uh, D&D style games, I tend to lean into the rules a little more uh, to, to, so that we can have that experience with the game because that's what the game does best. I will say what Chaotic is bringing up in chat is absolutely true, though. We are, um, I'm, I'm just going to speak for all of us, hoping that I'm not wrong, dice gremlins at heart and collecting the shiny macrocks. Clicky clackies. Happy hormones. <laughs> so that, that's definitely one net positive of of Lots of dice. Lots uh, of dice. One of the Lots. things I want to do as a designer is bring in more polyhedral into these indie games. These indie games always use six-sided dice. And I was like, well, yeah, but we have all these other dice hanging around. Yeah. It's like, don't we lie. Should... We all know we have them. Like, they're, they're, uh, they're some... around. Give some love to the D12. Nobody loves the D12. I know. I, well, I, I do Black Void now, and Black Void is a D12-based system, which is yeah. fun because it still uses... That's a great example of um, the randomizer you choose driving the kind of narrative. And I, when I talked to Christopher about this in an interview, I did, not on this show, but on another show, um, that was part of his idea is that it's a D12-based system, but much like a D20 D&D style system, a natural 20 is still a critical success and a natural 1 is still, or a natural 12, rather, in this case, is still a critical success and a natural 1 is still a critical failure. So it just means that the system just swings way more wildly from from dramatic success to dismal failure like that's just it's meant to be that way um it's meant to be a little bit wild and a little pulpy and it it works like that was a smart that was a smart call on, on, on his choice sounds fun it is I it's, appreciate, it's entertaining i appreciate the um the, the cult approach i don't know if that was just for we for back then encounter um where the nightmare mode and 2020, 2020 mode, mode just took your dice down from a d10 to an 8 to a d6 to a d4 yeah so that, that was a tension gosh. building mechanic it yeah. was that horrifying was i don't think right. that's in the actual rules of cult i wasn't sure either i don't think it is look you know it's mitch who knows what's and the rules and what's in his brain but it was hilarious to watch let me tell you <laughs> yeah yeah especially because everything in Every, everything is a uh, uh, just about every ability in cult uh, nine or less is failure. So if you're rolling d sixes instead of d tens to get that number, you're kind of fucked. Uh, and if you if you're rolling d fours, you can't get it at all, <laughs> even if you wanted to. So, uh, so yeah. you you have to roll double and hope your modifier is high enough to get you over the hump to ten. It's terrifying. I love that. That was that was really really. It does fun. And candles, the uh, <clears throat> talk about a, a tension maker and a and a dice mechanic. I mean, you, oh you, God, you, your pool gets depleted depleted with every mistake essentially, and mm -hmm. it just ramps up the tension. I um I did a reverse on that for sixteen candles, where you would get more <laughs> dice as the game would go on, and then by the end of it, you got everything your high school heart ever wanted. You know, <laughs> so Molly Ringwald, really, that's, yeah, that's. that's... What, yeah, most high Speaking of ten candles, um, as we as the show was going live, I bought your uh, on drive through. I bought your ten workers united game. That was a ten candles hack. Yep. Yeah, and also done About starting a union. Here for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's because you have no power at the beginning. It's 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 in reverse. Just like I explained yeah. with sixteen candles, um, you have no power in the beginning, but by the end, you have all the all the dice. So you um, have to build your union. I love this. This is great. Thank you for Thank making you. this.
that I did that during the Kickstarter uh, dispute that was going on at the time, and kind of as a way of doing something about yeah. it. That's, that's a beautiful, creative way to be passive aggressive. It was very passive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised they let it off. On this um, channel, we are always here for being petty. <laughs> <laughs> it's part. It's in our DNA. It's part of what we do. Should we, should we rename Colonomicon to Petty Con Communists? Ah, yes. Petty, co petty Colonomicus? To get, hmm. we'll, we'll workshop that. We'll, we'll workshop that. We've talked that. about a couple of games, though. At this point, we mentioned Black Void, we mentioned Cult, and uh, you have a nice little array of different genres as well in, in your own works. Um, but Chaotic earlier was asking what your favorite genre is, fantasy, horror, and all these classic, classic genres. What do you like working in? I mean, if I had a pick, I, I think I always lean into horror. Um, my, my wife, Kathleen Kaufman, is a horror author. And so, you know, we, we both are just really into that genre. Um, and I kind of accidentally put it into all of my games on some level. <laughs> um, so I, I think if I had to pick one, it would be that. I, I also really enjoy um, uh, suburban, well, sub I almost called it suburban fantasy, which is funny. Um, urban fantasy, I guess also suburban fantasy. Um, but yeah, I do like, I do like the, uh, you know, werewolves in London kind of mm. stuff. And, and Great American Witch does strike a chord as my, my ideal genre sort of like, you know, the show Supernatural or, um, oh boy, you know, anything in that genre I'm going to really like. Yeah, I, I, the horror thing is I, I wanted this game to be a little bit more lighthearted because our last D&D game was so very, very deep into the feels. I'm like, I need a little bit of a breather and I have a lot of horny players, so this will be fun. <laughs> I just give them werewolf boyfriends and everyone will be happy. And now, poor fool. Two, poor fool. two episodes in, I'm sitting here, oh, oh, Rindis is communicating with death every now and then. This is going to be good. Oh, oh, she's haunted by spirits. You touch everything. You Everything you touch breaks apart. It's your fault. Oh, this is going to be good, psychological. I'm like, wait, what am I doing? Um, oh, it's... It yeah. lends itself so beautifully to that. Yeah, and it was well, a lot of this came out of um, uh, True Blood and um, the American Horror Story Coven. I kind of wanted to capture that feeling, so because it can go dark, but it doesn't always. And um, and I always, I always really, the the games that I've run on which though have universally been um, very deep psychologically and you know in, in times of, of really deep horror even though the group might be light-hearted so i don't know if it's something about the genre or the system that drives that i think the genre and it's certainly the witchcraft thing um it's i think every girl at some point had a witchcraft phase where we were attracted to some form of of witch pop culture pop media just because they it all has, watch the craft and it has, oh, yeah, it has usually I something so craft. freeing uh to it especially when you are fairly early this is going to be a feminist round deal with it um when you when you start to be confined to very rigid roles and expectations and gender performance which is is a thing for both genders obviously not that there's only two genders but both of the traditional upbringings are like yeah you boys will be boys they're just like that but girls mature much quicker than boys no they're just forced to mature much quicker because they'll get in trouble if they don't and the witchcraft thing has always had that little i mean it's the temptation right to to go against religion go against social expectations and and it's certainly in the last several decades really it's it's gone from oh it's gonna end well for those witches oh they followed temptation and look at it this is a this is a tale of morality and what you shouldn't do to yeah but it's fun let's do it anyway and, and, <laughs> and kind of allowing that to take over and be portrayed and painted as as that breakout and as that non-conforming um epiphany almost so when you mentioned coven in particular i think that has done a lot in that regard um is that the one with stevie nicks yeah, mm -hmm. yeah badass. that's so good badass. Uh, it was I, I love that they actually got her for this it's I, so perfect. I love it. perfect casting if ever there was yeah yeah um, so yeah i think that that is um certainly a little bit of a of an appeal i can see for myself and um 
that leans into the horror thing that leans into against society standards women in horror have always had a really interesting role I, I might be talking about this for ages as well I'm sorry um, but we do the, the horror festival here in Edinburgh and we have the ghost tours and we have all these beautiful things um, and there's so many women involved in that because very often it's the first thing you see when you grow up on television as well you, you watch horror films where sure it's a lot of torture porn but the woman usually survives at the end and well at least one of them does at least one of them yeah, yeah you get your but, final uh, girl whether yeah. it's the Jamie final Curtis girl, yeah. or, or Dave Campbell or um, even I would classify Ripley uh, to a certain sure. extent whoever the one was that. in yeah. Texas Chainsaw Massacre I can't recall who that was but yeah I'm not sure either. There's a final girl um, in there. Or, you know, Rob Zombie's wife and everything he does. But <laughs> it's it's always empowering. Even though the stereotypes around it aren't necessarily empowering, but in the end, it was still new. It was still shocking. That's part of the horror in many ways to yeah. people watching. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's right. I mean, my uh, and my wife, not to bring her up again, she, a lot of uh, the fundamentals of which was based on her fiction. Um, and so I drew a oh, lot from cool. there. And she, and she always plays off, I mean, she, Mary Shelley and some of these old, you know, the really uh, groundbreaking uh, women horror. It, it, horror came from from that genre. Um, and she, uh, the, the book in particular, Hag, which everybody watching this should go out and buy. I'm trying to get those books to you, Lydia. I got that sit back. I don't know what's going on with all that. But anyway, <laughs> the Hag is um, about uh, many generations of, of Scottish witches and um and then sort of the moving from the old world to the new and 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 it's just this kind of sweeping legacy but the 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 thing that got me about that book the most was just how op these witches were um <laughs> but without having to you know use it but when they did you know villages died and and that was sort of what i wanted to bring into which that, that idea of empowerment rather because a lot of the uh the genre when you, when you think about things like vampire um is that it's a sort of male power fantasy where you know either you're you're tearing down the the institution um, or you're tearing down yourself you know there's usually this big self-destruction theme and there's and and there's sort of this you know bringing down the world theme and what i wondered with with which was kind of pull these themes from hag which is really about pers uh, you know persevering uh, and it's about uh, empowering the legacy going all the way back and, and about using power, but when you need to do it to fix things or, you know, help the world or do something, uh, you know, constructive as opposed to destructive. And and I think a lot of those themes um, are my favorite part of the game. And so when I watch uh, when I watch uh, these these other shows that they're sort of inspired by, I think that's what I, I like the most about them. They typically do that. Yeah. The hag in particular is such a fascinating character. And just the fact that hag is technically a derogatory term in modern day and when you look at the actual background uh, when it comes to the Kaliach in particular, the Scottish hag and the various storm hags that you can see throughout Scottish uh, legends and mythology it's just bloody fantastic they could move landscapes it's it's uh, you read it and you get goosebumps because yeah, that power fantasy is so bloody inherent in, in the mythology itself and you know then a lot of them got burned about 1,800 that we know of on trials, and James VI was a bit of a dick. But a, little, a little repressed and took it out <laughs> on people. A little, little repressed, the poor boy. Yeah, we apparently... I know I've been telling you this for a while, but you need to see the Doctor Who episode with James VI. I, I know it's I do. I haven't hilarious. Seen they play it's, um... it so perfectly repressed. <laughs> they do that <laughs> element so well. I wonder what happened to him on that, because that all started when he got waylaid somewhere or stuck in some place. He was, um, oh, this is the tour guy coming out. This is, oof. I uh, told you we would bring tangents. <laughs> 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 he was supposed to um, come pick up his new wife, you know, as you do. As you do, as a, yeah. <clears throat> gay king. Um, <laughs> he was supposed to pick up his wife, Anne of Hashtag Denmark, and a storm was preventing them from from coming back to scotland and one of the captains supposedly blamed his mother-in-law for being a witch and started to talk talk to him about how witches conjure up storms and conjure up the elements and he got it into his head that they were after him personally um james six is is known as a poet king and as a 
scientist in a weird way. He didn't just do the Bible thing, but he had he had quite a lot of books published. One of them is Demonology, mm, which is right. bloody fantastic. And in in one of those, uh, I don't I'm not sure if it's in the foreword or just uh, one of the other things it said. But one of his things was uh, he is obviously God's representative on Earth because that's what kings are and do. Divine right, so, all that, yeah naturally witches would have it out for him because they are envoys of satan and it is his god-given right and it is everyone's duty if you love your king to weed out the witch threat in your community so he started this witch craze which was actually not quite as popular in england um, but scotland totally went with it scotland always had a little bit more of a continental approach to everything and because it was big on the continent they were like yay let's go so over from ireland and all the cool the kids are doing it yeah i mean if the, the french are burning craze. witches you know <laughs> now we can do it too yeah we'll show um, them we had the well the north barrack trials technically that's Wouldn't the, the more scottish thing to would be to deep fry the witches though right <laughs> can't believe it's the first time i've ever made that joke i can't believe so either it's uh I mean, it wasn't can... one of uh, James's books used in the Salem Witch Trial and to identify whether or not they were witches. Quite I can't possibly, remember. yeah. That the demonology has the various pointers as to what makes a witch. And you have the whole idea of witch duking, of course, which was famously portrayed in Monty Python, the Holy Grail. Nice. Right. Um, yeah. Which is a lot closer to the actual logic they had, because the basic idea is that evil spirits and witches cannot cross running water, because water is a symbol of life, a symbol of God, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So they'll go, yeah, um, I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, so if you take a witch and submerge her in water, she, she won't be submerged in water because that would be the holiness accepting her and it will just she will just be repelled so if she floats she's guilty if she drowns she's most likely dead and will try and fish her out but that often led to well let's give it another minute and then <laughs> she was dead but she would be given a christian burial and the family got a letter saying oops are bad well, if what um, else can you really ask for if she was repelled which often was the case because um, partly, you know, petticoats are floating, partly you just don't struggle and you float anyway, and partly because in Edinburgh in particular, the 300 witches we threw into the Norloch, well, it was full of sewage, so there, wow. never mind. Um, and when that happened, you had the first hint and proof even that she was guilty, and once you got the confession, you had your hanging or your burning. And then the family also got a letter, but it was a bill because they had to pay for the kindling. <sighs> okay. You Jorge really miss your job, don't you? I miss yeah. my job so much. <laughs> like, guide it sounds people. like the uh, it sounds like United States healthcare system, actually. Yeah, that's Pretty actually cool. not so. Ooh, yeah. Which burn. I mean, yeah, um, if your dog gets Lord. euthanized, do you get a bill for it? I've had that happen to a friend of mine. So, like, I mean, like, yeah. if you, I mean, not like by choice. I mean, I had a friend whose whose dog bit their neighbor, therefore it was forcibly euthanized, and then they had to pay for it. That insult yeah. to injury. So, it's not so dissimilar. I think in a Great American Witch, just to bring it back a bit, uh, a Thanks. lot of that. Um, <laughs> it was, Thank that you. Was your job, Lydia. Sorry. You want to host a lot this thing, of, Chris? <laughs> a, a lot of that history was um, kind of uh, d divorced in a way, in that um, in, in Great American Witch, witchcraft is sort of a, a, a something you can do because you can connect to the powers of creation, um, and and it's not religious. So while there was a history of religions doing what they did to quote unquote witches, they were maybe or maybe not witches. Uh, and and that, that kind of created sort of a an alternative timeline in a way where there was the real witches and then there were the innocent people being persecuted as witches. So that's that a little bit is in there. We actually there's actually a bit of a, a, a alternative history laid out on how the witches got to America and what and how they were formed and all of that. So we, um, this is, I'm glad Chaotic asked this because I was considering asking this very same thing, less specific, uh, and I will, I'll ask Chaotic's version and then my own. Um, but you mentioned, yeah, horror being kind of your happy place. Uh, what are your kind of like top three, your desert island horror games, if you had to pick? Ooh. Oh man, this is a tough question. Now I'm giving dead air. So I, I, I definitely think that uh, uh, Ten Candles needs to be on that list. It's it's one That's of my all-time favorite games. 
Um, the thing, the reason I hesitate is because I don't know that I would need to have that on a desert island because it's just so easy to run. You know, I don't need the book. <laughs> Every time you do the desert island question, someone takes it too literally. <laughs> well, I think I'd want to have a game about uh, how to build a fire if that was possible. Right. <laughs> Something about the Zweihander book just because it's really good kindling. Yeah, the Zweihander book will keep you will but... keep you warm for a long time. That's right. fair. That's funny. Uh yeah, I so I think the Tin Candles. The other two horror, let's see. Um, I think I would probably bring Strahd. Really? Because uh that is a, a fun campaign and would never get bored with it. Are we talking um, the the fifth edition version or the fifth edition. Okay. Yeah. I you know, it's funny about that is I I, I got uh, really frustrated with the campaign because it took so long to get to the castle that I actually mm. made a hack where you can just go storm the castle in one shot. <laughs> uh, and not get murdered immediately? Well, no, you would get murdered, but you would at least get to see the castle. So, yeah. You know. It took us... Um, two, I, I'm, I'm still GMing that campaign right now, <laughs> and it's taken us two and a half years to get to Ravenloft, but they're finally there. We made Susie read out every single inscription in every single crypt room and tomb. Those and, horrible and, fucking and puns. It was great. I got an imp out of it. I named him Calcifer and he had a chef's hat on. It was very horrible. <laughs> it was really scary, totally. <laughs> and for my third one, um, I, I, without being self-serving, I think um, <laughs> I could say any of my games, but... <laughs> Um, let's go with other games. I think, uh, oh boy, uh, hmm. I, I would probably say Monster of the Week, even though it's not horror. It can um, be. I love that game so much, and you could definitely bring out the horror in it. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I know you're expecting me to say cult and things like that. I, 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 I have a kind of uh, genre that I go after, and you know, sometimes I don't. Uh, use genres in the way they were expected. So it, my horror game might appear more like, you know, The Mummy mm. than, than, like, you know, Which an actual today. horror game. Currently uh, yeah, fresh but, in my mind. Uh, but yeah, you know, any of the White Wolf games probably would be on that list, but we're past three now, so. Mm. Yeah, start. you know, I wasn't, I, I didn't really have any expectation. Um, I I will say, yeah, Monster of the Week is uh, interesting. It, it's my favorite game, personally, and it it can be you can make it horror if you want. You, to, you had to us be. do a fill out a spreadsheet of our deepest darkest fears. Yes, it can. Yeah, be well, it can be horror. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think putting deepest darkest fears into a spreadsheet is a deep dark fear. <laughs> there are some people currently in my chat who would agree with you on that very point because I have done it to them. <laughs> I like spreadsheets. My deadly oh, we spreadsheets. Didn't mention Call of Cthulhu. That would have to be on. Oh there. yeah. Oh jeez. Too late now. No take. No take backs. What, well, so the other way I'd pitch that is, um, what what games uh, have primarily influenced you in your own game design? Uh, the ones that really, really stood out to you as things that's like, shit, this is groundbreaking, and I want to do this, uh, you know? Yeah, uh, the big ones were well, fate, uh, fate actually had a lot to do with how I look at games, and and you'll see a lot of fate in Great American Witch and Great American Novel. Um, I like the idea of controlling the meta. Mm. of the game above and beyond what the characters are doing um bedlam hall which is kind of a funny example but that introduced me to power by the apocalypse um bedlam hall is monkey fun oh you, you've got to check out bedlam hall uh monkey fun studios is dave Pizet, um who is an amazing game designer and, and bedlam hall is basically um the adams family meets down nabby oh my powered by the apocalypse what? It's hilarious. <laughs> you don't even need to play it. You just need to read it. And it, it is hilarious. It's one of my all-time favorite games. But that one showed me the power of PBTA. You know, and how you can really use the system to drive whatever specific point you want to drive. Uh, so I, I have to hand a lot over to, to Dave on that one. Uh, other influences, I think um, it's hard to get away from my uh, my trad background with uh, specifically Call of Cthulhu, but also there's a lot of D&D &D in my thinking. Mm. But I, I guess that would be hard to notice, I guess, if you're looking at my games, but there is. I mean, I, I always compare and contrast uh, as much as I don't want to. I always compare and contrast designs to D&D &D and how, how it would be experienced by a, a trad player. It's not a terribly, uh, from a marketing perspective, it's not a terribly bad way to look at it, like with the understanding that 
most people who play your game are probably going to have played D&D at some point in their life. So Yeah, that's a great equalizer. Yeah. It's wild how, yeah, even in in communities where we pride ourselves on, on playing indie games and, you know, getting away from the traditional D&D stuff, um, in the end, there's always the... So what's the equivalent of an insight check here? Yes. Always. <laughs> it, it, right. Every bloody game. It I'm drives playing... me nuts, but it's true. You use D&D yeah. terminology to... As a, it's a lens through which we we all look, and it's just yeah. you can't escape it. It's yeah, it just makes sense to design it like that. It's funny that you mentioned Fate because I hadn't played Fate oh. before uh, Saturday, and I was because I'm taking Trooper's Fate of Cthulhu game that mm -hmm. we have on Wii. Oh yeah, that's a good release. I'm very happy with that game. <gasps> yeah, yeah, it's so good, and Trooper's doing a fantastic job as well. Um, the time travel bullshit, Colin, you need to watch this. It's right down your alley. <laughs> Trooper's doing time travel bullshit. Yes, Here yeah. for it. and I get to be yeah. the time travel bullshitter. Um, the, the premise of of that of uh, the the fate fate of Cthulhu is is just wild. It's yeah. great. Um, yeah, it's the return of the king in yellow. So the whole plague background is quite topical. Mm. Um, but it, what I'm why I'm coming back to this? I'm really rambly today. But <laughs> um, the fate points in particular with the charms in yeah. Great American Witch was like ah there we go, because um, yeah the that's something I hadn't really played with before, except for, of course, the narrative handover in, in Ten Candles. Um, but but those fate points, I feel, sometimes it feels like people are almost scared to use them. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how, how, how powerful am I allowed to be, how mm -hmm. much of the narrative am I allowed to take over. And I did find that in, in Great American Witch as well. Like I, I need to kind of, here, have all the, all the, here's the charms, use them, please. Um, but yeah, I, I could see the inspiration there, and I could see the parallels. And, and Trooper has a really good way of, of of tickling them out of you, and like making notes. So I yeah, yeah I can see the parallels. It it's it's hard for gamers to spend currency, and um, one one of the ways in in which is, 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 is and you don't have to play it this way. I, I think that the conflicts are a way to visualize it. This is also pulled from Fate. The idea that you're putting a conflict on the table that helps guide the fiction and when you want to go after that conflict again uh but you've already resolved it uh it, which happens a lot in games like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, swing from the chandelier and attack this this threat and you knock the threat down but you know now they're running away well i'm gonna keep attacking the threat well now you're just kind of beating the same narrative dead horse so the conflict requires that you pay to go after it again um but you can also escalate and and so it's, it's about changing the fiction so you can compel people to spend by by using what you would say hard move in a pbta game mm. it is fun yeah once they spend they have control and that's the other thing that the limits of that are always uh, like you can control any conflict that is not on the table or you can control anything that's not on the table so that that means that you're not going to take control of your big bad villain because mm. that villain's on the table but Anything else, yeah, you know, up to you. You're the GM now. I always find that funny, though, that it is, and I, I think this is another example of the the long shadow of D&D, in that D&D, for my money, I think D&D is a, a disempowering system when it comes to players, that the, you don't get a lot of those moments of you're the GM now in D&D. It's just not cooked in, really. That You don't take narrative control. You don't take the reins in the game. The GM... DM always has it, and then your job is to know the rules well enough that you can force things to happen because the rules say so. Um, but you don't get to just carte blanche, make shit happen. Um, and breaking... Pl if players, I've noticed, like, if they've only played D&D, &D, and then you're getting them in other games of doing that, breaking them of that and getting them to realize, like, you really do... You have the power, my brother. Like, you can make stuff happen. Um, or just, like my GMing style is I like to toss control of stuff over to players and let them do things. And it's sometimes like, it requires a lot of like, it's almost like they're traumatized. Like there's a little bit of coaxing to like get them to do that in the beginning. And it's cool. I mean, I think it's cool that the way you designed, um, like the way you designed witch to like, to have things like that is, is very clever. And it's a, it's a great example of mechanics serving the narrative and mechanics helping to guide the, the role play. And it's, yeah, it's a, it's a tough thing to capture though. Um, it, it, it's it's something I've in designing games had trouble figuring out how to do that, how to empower the players to, to get them to do that. Um, I remember when Matt Mercer's you know started the uh, what does that look like thing, and you know, the entire D and D world was like, 
or the simple how do you want to oh, do how this? How do you want to do that? that yeah. How do you want to yeah, do this? Yeah. yeah. Gasp! Yeah, no, now that's like that's pretty standard fare now. Yeah. Pearl clutching. It's... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's something that I find some players aren't comfortable with as well. Um, yeah. I've had that in just my home games where mostly if you have people that stream RPG games, you, you have the Leroy Jenkinses, like a lot of them will want that narrative control and will hunger for it and are only too happy to, to contribute. Um, but especially in my home games, when I've tried making NPCs with them, for example, like, okay, you tell me who that person is exactly, you tell me what they look like. It's just the deer in the headlights. It's like, oh, yeah, I don't know. I don't, uh, I don't want to tell you. That's fine. Um, occasionally, you, you do have people who just feel like this is almost like going to the movies, but you have a little bit of control over your own character. But, but everything else, they're happy to just consume rather than contribute. Yeah. So, um, some players are more passive. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Um, but it definitely has become more rewarding for me as a GM to to do something with the players. I'm always quite amazed at GMs who are not wanting to hand over control because they exist as well. Hmm. Um, <laughs> well the so stories maybe. that come out of that shared narrative is always amazing. I mean, I'm always flabbergasted by how things work out, you know, and, and it's nothing that one brain could ever do. The yeah. buy-in is also automatic. If, if I oh, yeah. make part of that world, I'm much more invested in yeah, it. You have skin in the game now. Yeah. <sighs> Did we have that? Oh yeah, we already yeah. If hmm? oh sorry, I lost my train of thought. I was I was looking at the questions we had in here, and I realized we I'd already yeah. asked that one. So. And yeah, because uh, Funky Baba Ganoush has has uh, commented on it as well. Obviously, there is always room for both. It's it's oh, the problem arises when you have the contrarians or when you have contrary forces. When a GM doesn't want to hand over control, but he has. A bunch of players or they have a bunch of players that want to be part of, of the world making and vice versa so it's it's always there's a game out there for everyone Just sure sometimes one game isn't exactly yeah and i think even which can be played like that um I, I i think that the stories that come out of the shared experience are, are way more significant though when when it's played as written hmm we have we've had some wild stuff happen and i played that game now i mean it, it's only been on the market now i think a few months but I, I, it's hard for me to remember that because i've been playing this game for a couple of years mm. and i've had at least two long-standing campaigns in it and it's um it's it's always amazing the stories that come out of that and great american novel too it, it they kind of create experiences that that stay with you more than your more transactional game um, and when you have a shared experience i think that's why because you, you leave the table thinking, you know, I, I feel like I've just read a novel. I, I really feel like this is a significant story that I can't stop thinking about. Mm -hmm. And it stays with you. I mean, the games that we've played on, on in, in these systems have just stayed with me. And I don't think it's a magic of the mechanics or anything. I think it's because it, it's the shared, uh, the shared power people have over the narrative and you create stories that you would never be able to create on your own. I do think to the extent though, yeah, like I said, I think the mechanics drive that if they if, if the mechanics just are more conducive to that happening, are more conducive to that kind of um I, you know, I, I, I'm opposed to I, I'm implacably opposed myself to like the monolithic GM. Like I don't I don't believe in that. I don't practice that. Uh the I create the world and you all live in it, GM. Like that's not fun to me and that that's not as memorable to me. Um it's it's much more exciting when, yeah, there is the, the buy-in from everybody, and the you all have a stake in the, in the creation of of the world. I think that's much more interesting. And some games are just better at making that happen than others. Um, you know, I think you've designed a, a few that make it that make it work really, really well. Um, but I'm trying to think of a, another game off the top of my head that I think does a really good job of that. Um, I mean, some immersion games is hard to just pick one. There have been so many good ones lately. Uh, <laughs> I, I've really been enjoying um, uh, uh, what's happening in the uh, st what we would call the story game market, where there's mm. just uh, just wild games. I mean, stuff that uh, I, I uh, Kurt and Kate Potts just did. I, I helped them with this Kickstarter, which is still uh, oh man, no, it's done. It just finished. Mm. It's called Lighthearted. And it was actually, it came out of um, 
Savage Worlds, ironically, really? but then got adapted to Hell too. Is is totally unrecognizable. <laughs> but um, but yeah, you play you play basically the Brat Pack in a in a magical community college, at, in 1980s, and it's this really awesome game. But the primary uh, stats are your emotions, mm. and and it's like your your starting emotion versus the emotion of what you need to use in that moment, and that kind of contrast Interesting. creates the dice that you use. And and that you know when when you see what's going on out there in game design, it's just mind blowing. It, and it's it's hard to keep up. And I, I actually read games now just to read them because. I think the uh, watching how the mechanics flow is just an entertainment of in of itself. Like anything John Harper is doing lately. Oh, fascinating work! Right. Aegon, or actually, is supposed to be a gone, I think. But is it supposed to be a gone? Uh, if you if you speak Greek, I guess. Yeah, oh, I don't really know. That. Damn. Doesn't um, sound as like badass. Doesn't as sound Aegon. as good though. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I, can check, I can check with Cleo if you want. But, I mean, that one I wouldn't even call a role playing game. Like it's just a really really interesting dice game, you know, and and it's awesome but it, it's it, deliciously it's just... simple we we played yeah. it on uh we played it on this channel a couple of weeks ago and like the whole it's it's really brilliant in the whole um just like single it's single role resolution it's um for every scene we all roll uh we determine based on that if we succeed or fail no matter what you don't cry about it you don't re-roll there's no re-rolling you move on to the next thing yeah go but we all narrate island. it together and make it interesting yeah and, and yeah. see what the story is and it's it's a, it's a great storytelling game it's really clever and it, now he has an srd for that too that's um oh is that right Ooh, yeah it's called the, go tinker yeah go play with it uh it's called the um it's called the paragon system he's licensing okay. it out now yeah and there's been a few hacks of it so far it's a it's great it's a system with with great potential i think there's a lot yeah. to be done with that yeah definitely i um yeah i'll check that out i um I grabbed the SRD from from Free League and ran, and now have Temples and Tombs out. So mm -hmm. I love SRDs. Yeah, huge fan of SRDs. Everyone make SRDs. I want to be able to steal your shit and, well, you know, legally steal your shit. And use it in game. Yeah, I want to adapt your shit. I, um, I, I would love to do an SRD for Can. I just don't know how it would work. I've got it through and I haven't been able to figure it out because it's just so variable by the genre. An SRD for what? For a great American novel. Oh, okay. But it, it, I haven't cracked that nut yet. Hmm. Um, I quite liked uh, Spoken Magic as well as a non dice roll. I mean, there, there's some, there, there's fail and success, but having the various words that you're given on cards, in this case, um, give to give them value as you go and as you play when you create the spells with the various words and what they mean exactly and how how they pertain to the situation, um, linguistically speaking, and it, it's quite interesting and fascinating. The narration around it isn't, it's up to the players and it's up to the GM. So there's, as far as I know, as far as I remember, it's been a while, um, no real push towards it, but the, it almost feels like you're making the mechanics up as you go. And that's fascinating. It's not precisely that, but it feels like it because you, yeah, because you create the words. I quite enjoyed that. For the Queen's another one that's entirely narrative. Mm. And it's, it's the kind of thing you can play on a car trip, and it's it's really high up there on my list as an innovation and in design. And I'm seeing more uh, Descended from the Queen hacks that are all very exciting. That's one I keep getting recommended to me. Multiple, Maybe. you're you're not the first guest on this show to, to mention For the Queen's, and I still haven't. Played it. That's... Write it down for the Sundays. Write it down. Can you play it on stream though? It's all card. Yeah, there's a there's a roll twenty version. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm. There's just so. Was missing was was similar in the just completely text based. Anna's been singing its praises, and everyone she's played with it has joined the chorus because it is. Have you played it? And Alice is missing. Uh, no, I know all about it though, um, mm. uh, and I, I still haven't played. I'm a little afraid to play it, to be honest. I mean, I've read it, and I've heard um, people who have played it their experience with it, and it's always kind of like I'm not sure I am mentally prepared for this. But um, it's intense. But, yeah, and Spencer ran intense. it at at Big Bad Con when I was there, and it was really funny every time because he was running it back to back. It was in promotion mode, and every time somebody left that game, they were just like. 
that thousand yard stare <laughs> yeah you know, are you all right you need a drink buddy you know and it was i know man no, I need it a was drink all right oh man and but, but spencer poor spencer he had to run that game back to back over and over for the entire con and by the end of it, he was like he was lying on the floor going i can't even think right now i just need to and so i've been doing at least two a week for the last three four weeks just and that's by choice nobody's paying her <laughs> to promo it that's just pure masochism um Still enough, same thing. We we it's super, just punch in the guts, and we latched onto it like nothing. What is wrong with us? Is the question. <laughs> oh, it's it's such a powerful game, and um, I I do need to play it at some point. It um, has a uh, Alice is missing. Also has a um soundtrack that goes with it. Yes, that, that's up on YouTube. And when you play it with that going too, it's a whole new layer to the experience. Like you have to play. I've heard that you have to do that. It's, yeah. it's not even the same experience if you don't. I couldn't imagine the game without it, but of course I've only ever played it with it. Um, but I, yeah. I just it really did kind of make a lot of the experience. Spencer makes some amazing games. Icarus is another one that he did that um, is on my list of my favorite games. And it, it, you just play out the fall of an empire, Ooh, that's um, badass. and you do it by stacking dice through the narrative. And when too many dice get stacked, it collapses, oh. and it's it's great. It's oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah, it's a really good one. That's what you get for for saying you like horror games and but then it's you know being part of it suddenly is very different than gming it and writing it isn't it yeah that's right <laughs> I, I love jump scaring people on the ghost tours i hate when it happens to me <laughs> just looked up that game now that looks awesome man he is Chris, clever yeah. he's a clever dude yeah he is he's uh he's working for critical role now oh yeah. moving on promise land dude <laughs> Uh, Chaotic had another question earlier on. Any scenarios for a game you love, no matter the genre? Scenario like um, like an adventure. I guess uh, um, I would think of that as like when I hear scenario, I would think a a, a type of situation you like playing out in an RPG. I don't know. Do you like people stuck in an elevator? Um, or uh, what's I love I like a that. bunch of dream diving bullshit. And no matter what it is, I love... I mean, it's my favorite. That's so much fun. Yeah, I, I, I think if one I end up defaulting to is, I mean, I like the big sweeping journeys. Mm. Um, at whether it be fantasy or, or anything else, I like the road movie genre. Ah, yes. Uh, so that's so that, which is kind of ironic because that's what the, the witch campaign is like now. That, um, uh, But the uh the 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 idea of like cr crossing continents and you know like lord of the rings on one end or thelma and louise on the other mm, yeah the we have to cover a large distance uh scenario <laughs> Let's i also get like to chases it. chases yeah i think those are fun i always love a good chasing do you have I one like i like a little bit of mind fuck people hearing voices that they're that nobody else can hear seeing having visions that kind of cuts a little bit into the dream stuff mm. um like we started with nanishka last episode with her being in the bar and yeah hearing the voices and then waking up i i yeah i appreciate a little bit of fucking with player psyche as you well know yeah, on the Hecate, it's really easy to do that. Like in my, in my home game, there was um, she was a Hecate witch and just kind of like, you know, eating cereal at the breakfast table. And there was a, a little Puritan girl standing in front of her, you know, and she's kind of eating and saying, uh, "Were there uh, were there pilgrims in, in, uh, in, in, in wherever the town they were in, 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 in this town?" And you don't know whether they had Puritans, you know, and it's just just watching this spirit you know as she, that kind of stuff plays really well on that on that cup and type yeah they there's a couple of ghosts that have kind of in mind that might make an appearance some more benevolent and than others Faye is always fun too yeah the cat is a, a, a cat she so that might come I, they've given me so much i'm <laughs> like i only have 10 to 12 episodes i don't know i want to do that in and that in and that in um so how how that's all going to be connected is going to be a big challenge that i am looking forward to and if you start manifesting gods then things go real sideways real quick <laughs> let's start with the illuminati that. for now <laughs> start small just the illuminati <laughs> yeah yeah just small fish i i up. love i love dream divey bullshit because i love as a gm the fact that it lets me do whatever i want 
because um, mm. now and then also like if i do know your character's deepest insecurities and fears i just make them manifest because now i can just do that and that's also extremely fun <laughs> um uh, chaotic story actually uh clarified the question and so i'll rephrase it i had it wrong um so it sounds like chaotic story was asking more about um particular uh scenarios like it uh modules um regardless of game or cross genre that you find to be you know brilliant and that you love regardless of game or genre i um i, I, I this was kind of a classic answer but i think the masks of nylorn the mask of the end thing yeah yes yeah. is naira lithotep that i've one? never gotten very far in it um but <laughs> i i just love the concept of it again it's a big sweeping story Mm -hmm. um cross continents and things like that uh so that one's definitely high on my list i i don't use a lot of modules i i, I rip them off a lot that's what um, i do yeah uh, so i steal them yeah um i have used them in the past but it's uh, it's usually just sort of a, a bastardization of what was what was delivered that's yeah. why it's hard for me to write adventures it's like the hardest thing for me to do in game design because i don't use them myself so it's hard to project how you know how it's useful how one's how supposed it's to do this yeah yeah i have three in my game now yeah i like to take them so i'm i'm now kind of against the dungeons and dragons method of adventure module of like for like curse of Strahd being an example of like this is designed to take you from first to tenth level and this is going to take you months to play and it's one sweeping i don't really like that anymore because if the players aren't into it if, if for some reason at least one person in that party is not into what's going on well you're stuck with it for the next several months so you have to just ride it out you know yeah and we're I not getting any younger the, yeah yeah no, i i prefer to take the uh if i'm using modules as a basis for what i'm doing i like to take shorter ones and just stitch them together into something so if, if you don't like it you only have to ride it out for like four sessions and then it'll be something new after that that's that's more interesting to me and just take them and adapt them to what the players gave me whatever oh okay so like i don't know I, i'm using a one i'm gonna start a monster of the weekend on monday and the npcs that are in the pre-written adventure i'm using as a basis um well that person is now your cousin like i don't we'll we'll connect them to the care why not you know it, it's a decent enough way to do it and it saves me saves my prep time of having to sit down and because i'm not good at writing adventure stuff either i'm not good at writing um i don't know how to do it <laughs> like i don't really even though i use them i don't my brain, especially because I'm such an improv GM, I don't know how to plan, really. Your physical uncomfortableness is delightful, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it makes me scrunch up. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. I, don't know. I, I do like building blocks, though. Uh, that... uh, you know, like module builders. I love those, like randomizers and tables. And... Yeah, tables are fun. Yeah. I was gonna say I quite enjoyed that in Good American Witch because I generally am a homebrew GM. I don't, I've never GM'd a module in my fucking life, um, and I don't think I'm gonna start anytime soon because I'm used to it. I rip off history. That's what I do. But um, history yeah. is my module. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, which is why, yeah, Great American Witch was like, okay, we're setting this in New Mexico. I know nothing about New Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, hot. It's it's hot. There's except Kuyogis when it's not. <laughs> lots of Mormons. I don't know. Um, next door. Uh, anyway, the uh, the the coven of the town or the various coven uh, prompts and the what's is the is the coven wealthy and if so how what's the benefit of the coven that gives some really nice background structures to work with. Um, as do, of course, the ever-favorite uh, relationship bonds between characters. So, I, it's not a module, but yeah, as you said, prompts and building blocks are just enough and just right. The little Goldilocks perfect middle um, of, of giving you hints towards something and a couple of ideas, but not a if you do this then move forward to page 55 and this happens and once that the happens, choose your own adventure novel structure choose your own adventure right, yeah, right. that's just one of the one of the best feedback i got from happiest apocalypse actually i got it over and over again i was just about the, to transition to that <laughs> no. 
is it, is it creating your own theme park fit? And it's, it's, it's not so very in-depth. It's not very in-depth. It's like four pages, I think. But I get so much feedback out of that, not only when people read it, but when they play it. They just love, I mean, they could, you could spend the entire session just building your theme park and everybody would just be happy as pie, you know? It's fun. I mean, I have to, I feel like we did a piss poor job introducing Christopher. So like, I, I have to go back and um, <laughs> oh, we, we've dropped Christopher's links in chat. You can all, uh, you can all, I'll drop them again right now. You can uh check out christopher's website see all of the great games uh that he's made um but among which are the great american Witch, the great american novel um happiest apocalypse on earth uh 10 workers united which i just bought as this stream was going um a game called <laughs> goddamn fucking dragons and if that you don't oh, want to play that i don't know oh it's a novel sorry my bad that's a novel oh yeah, yeah it says novel right there whoops yeah Should read it's, a, much it's, more it's about terrible heroes <laughs> it's about terrible heroes. terrible heroes and goddamn fucking dragons yeah um yeah. And of course, it's great. See, you you got a game called Goddamn Fucking, or sorry, you have Goddamn Fucking Dragons. That's a novel, and then you have a game called The Great American Novel, which is a game. And it, it's very weird. Yeah, you're screwing with my brain here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and of course, the uh, the forthcoming uh, Temples and Tombs, um, filling that void in my heart for Indiana Jones uh, style role playing. That I don't know of any. It, was this another example? Was that another example, by the way, of a There's nothing else out there that does this. So I guess I'm gonna have to do it. Um, yeah, that's usually where my games come from. I want to mm. play this. Uh, there's nothing here. I'll play it. I'll make it. <laughs> um, it. But it's not only that, but it has to happen in a particular way. Like it needs to be, because you can do this in Call of Cthulhu, you know, but um, I, I, it needs to be fast paced. You don't think about the machine at all. You know, you you just swing from vines and take names, you know, and that's mm. the whole game's all about that. And so it's uh, it's it's meant to be a particular way. Like my, my own system wouldn't work. I had, a, I had a steal uh, three leagues. Mm-hmm. But luckily, oh, yeah, they, they uh, made yeah. an SRD. So. <laughs> Good old SRD. Um, but, uh, yeah, among those games Christopher's made, of course, is Happiest Apocalypse on Earth, which is um, one of my favorite PBTAs. Uh, and it's just fucking wild. And I, I have sold so many people on this game on the elevator pitch alone, which it's it's a PBTA horror game set in a miserable version of Disney World, basically. Um which has the most deliciously uh, like your default setting of like the, well you you create your own but the um the name just Mouse Park which is just yeah. such a backhanded way of referring to Disney parks that I love. Um, I know there were some litigation problem concerns, but I was you know was there? It's satire. I mean, what are the you know? It's yeah, fine. Come on, copyright laws account for this. Just, uh, you have the perfect target audience of all the disillusioned millennials. millennials because <laughs> we all grew up with Disney, and it's such a nostalgia point. But we also know how bad Disney is, and how evil, and how all domineering at this point. But we can't help but sing along <laughs> when "I'll Make a Man Out of You" comes. Along, so. <laughs> but it's about I know the you're an evil of... empire, but I just can't. It's catchy. <laughs> <laughs> catchy. it's about the inversion of innocence you know because you have this thing that served you and then you grow up you know and uh and there's so there's a lot of inversion of innocence throughout I mean, it's it's uh it, you know it's really inspired by five nights of freddy's you know that kind of like creepypasta sort of mm. uh you know movement that came out in the early aughts uh but yeah that's uh that's definitely the point yeah i was thinking of the other one that was I was just thinking of pun names, but I like the one Banksy made that was Dismal Land. Um, <laughs> that, yeah, same idea. Um, and this this game has just dropped it brilliant. And I, I do love when it comes to the, um, like, I literally flipped through this. This was one of the first, you were mentioning uh, reading, uh, reading games just to read them. This is one of the first games, I still have not played this game, but I have read this whole book just to read it because it's so fucking entertaining. That's um, awesome. <laughs> the fact that your, like, basic moves are like, be bold and daring. Wish upon a star. The fact that your kick some ass version of this is called Break Some Femurs is also one of my favorite. It's so specific and I love it. Um, well, and those are all Easter eggs if you look hard enough. Yeah, I don't know where Break Some Femurs comes from, but I recognize oh, some of the other ones. I cannot remember. I, it did come from somewhere, though. <laughs> I know that they're your roll plus wise here move, the uh, find something there that wasn't there before. <laughs> Brilliant. Um... Bit, uh, go the distance as you roll plus out. Yeah. Anyhow, yeah. Um, yeah. it's just it's it's hilarious, and I can't wait to, to finally actually play this game. But what was going through your brain when this one came out, though? I mean, what what this is? Okay, we were talking about the fact that uh, you your process tends to be that you you find that 
you want something that can't be found on the current TTRPG market. You you wanted Horror Disney World, which is a very specific want. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> couldn't well, it was because it. my kid wanted it. Um, ah. My kid was, I think he was, well, how old was he when that came out? I don't remember. He was a kid. Uh, but he uh, he wanted to play, uh, he said, quote, I want to play Cthulhu, but Disneyland. And so my wheel started turning. Your trying kid to go is my fucking library. awesome, by the way. Yeah, Let's I know. I, get you I'd a like kid to like take that. credit, but it's all him. <laughs> and so I'm going through my brain. I'm like, okay, uh, Call of Cthulhu, Monster of the Week came to mind. So I was like, okay, why don't I take Monster of the Week and, and run it? And then I realized, oh, it, it can't quite handle this if I just fix this and change this and add that. And then, you know, before long, I was just making a game. But it was... <laughs> definitely inspired by uh, monster of the week in terms of its chassis like if you if you compare the games they're very close mm-hmm. uh you got a new Nothing. customer chaotic story just bought happiest apocalypse on earth <laughs> as we're sitting here righteous yeah i can't wait to play this it's ridiculous yeah it's a hoot. I, I um I, I run it a lot and it always ends up the same way <laughs> it's always it down. Yeah, it's always like everything goes to hell. Yeah, nothing good comes from it. We got, we have these nice little tourists with Cthulhu. (laughs) The artwork is by uh, Ravi Bear, who uh, also did the art for Great American Novel and um, and Temples and Tombs, and is wonderful. Um, Yes, he does some great games too. Under um, so good, nerdy paper games. Sorry, Rob, if I'm messing that up. (laughs) We We should look it up. We can look him up and uh, drop some. uh, Drop some links in chat. We've had a question earlier that we've kind of... Sh- I've, I've been, oh, did I miss... Oh, you're we right. We've been around it just because it, I, I'm trying for good transitions. Um, <laughs> but... Um, well, you know, all those Disney parks were closed down because of COVID. So has... Go ahead. Good transitions. Yeah. Good. good. Um, no, I'm just... I have to scroll up because that's where it was somewhere. Ah, Yes. Um, with quarantine, I had one with the gold, yellow king and plague and stuff. Never mind. <laughs> so close. <laughs> <laughs> Golden Lasso Gala, actually. Can you ask earlier, has quarantine uh, m- and moving games remote impacted your approach to game design as well? Oh, uh, yeah, good question. Um, it, it definitely has because Great American Witch was c- designed with index cards in mind mm. and things like that. And so uh, I have definitely reined in how I think about design as a result. And I think that it's a good move for everybody designing games to think about how is this going to stream? Not just a virtual game, but how is it going to stream? And um, I, th- I think that most of my games don't stream well. <laughs> because I, I'm thinking about the table, you know? And, um, and so that, that definitely, the pandemic and virtual gaming has definitely put that front and center in my thinking. Yeah, it's, it's a different experience. Um... The conflict cards in particular, I, I like the idea of having it on the table, turning it sideways, and kind of keeping an eye on that. But yeah, I haven't really figured out a way for that to translate to stream. Um, I have a dock for all the NPCs and all the important places, so I have a list of, of conflicts that are sort of in the game, um, just to remind players in case they want to go after something specific. But yeah... It, the actual turning over, I think it would just detract from the streaming experience. There's... I did run it that way on, on Happy Jacks, and I, I, mm-hmm. I uh, used Jamboard to show the cards. Yeah, you mentioned um, that. But it was, it was distracting. You know, I had to, like, you know, remember to do that. <laughs> Everybody had to remember to look at that. And um, I think the virtual experience is definitely... You know, when we're seeing all these tabletop uh, simulators coming out, and uh, ultimately, uh, that's great for home groups, but we have to we have to recognize that streams are are what's driving the industry right now. So if you're not designing for streams, you're missing out on a lot of potential as a as a designer, just from a marketing point of view. Even the way streams are consumed is so interesting and changes the way you can play and you can you can market them. Um, I've been doing this just really intensely for a year and just figuring out how are you watching a stream are you even watching a stream do you have it on as as white noise in the background are you downloading it as podcast and then listen to it that way um because that changes what you can do and how you should do it while you're on the stream as well make sure you shout out the roles yes we have the roller on on stream but 
um, I personally prefer not to have it on the screen just because then people are forced to shout it out anyway. Uh, plus, I like giving them the clicky clacks. But scene transitions can be fantastic for, for people who are actually watching. Um, at the same time, how often are people coming in? What keeps them here? Like the, the marketing and the kind of research that we're so used to corporate from corporate products is not really there. Um, so you, you kind of have to wing it and hope for the best and hope that the way you, you put it out is easy to to ingest for everyone who's interested in it. But yeah, ingest and also and, and present. And, and, you know, I think one of the big missing components, at least in my designs, by being critical, is that it's uh, it's very machine focused. Like, how do you how do you make it cinematic effortlessly? as opposed to saying, okay, we're in this chapter now, these are the rules, we're in that chapter now. And, and again, it works great at a table, but not so much in a stream. And yeah. I think design needs to be simpler and um, more cinematic to feed that channel better. I've. It's funny that you should bring that up because that's definitely something that I've changed and that I've thrown out. As I said earlier, it's, it's, it's helpful when you read it. It's helpful for when you're new to storytelling in particular and when you come from the D&D background. I think that is incredibly successful. But when you want to create a narrative experience that is continuous and that isn't constantly interrupted by what are we doing it, it's just, I, I can't stop the game to make sure, even though I have my cue cards here, what exactly is possible here. Or, you know, tell oh no, you can't actually or you can just use magic here when a role would be so much more dramatic but does that mean we automatically have to move into a different chapter i don't think it's worth it necessarily just now it's staying that just do the role just just do the yeah. role just do whatever feels natural in the moment yeah and if you if you watch my stream it, it is it, it's not as obtrusive as it might sound but it does take you out of the cinematics because now you're talking meta and it's say like, okay now we're in we're, now we're in the mundane chapter so tell me what your aspect is and, you know and you kind of do that sort of uh, me mechanic house cleaning every mm -hmm. before you said that and, and, and it's fine and it works great but i don't think it's great for stream and so um that that's that just brings me back to i think that's if it, as designers that's probably where we should be focused there is there are ways to uh, work around it like the aspects i've just asked people in green room chat which mm -hmm. chat doesn't see so what aspect are we are we entering this scene in so i know so they know oh we're coming into a menace chapter without having to call it out for viewers but it still follows the basic idea of especially the menace and the milestone chapter where the aspects actually matter really right, right. um i don't want to lose that because i think that's a fantastic idea but um yeah it like the meta is has a right to be there and should be explained, especially at the beginning when viewers are just starting to watch it. But you have to make that call of keeping that balance. Yeah. Speaking of streamed games, uh, Chaotic asks, uh, have you ever had the desire to stream a game you designed on stream, even one you developed from way in the past? Yeah, I do. Uh, I do stream my games frequently enough. Um, I, I have to say it's very challenging. I. Um, I think there's a lot of emotional labor that goes into streams anyway, but then when it's your when it's your game, <laughs> probably mm. a little more. Yeah. Uh, I I found that I can do it in short bursts. Like I think I'm ready to do another one, um, but I've had uh, a few months off of my Happy Jacks one, and it, it did take a little while to to come back from that. Just from a, a I would say a, an emotional and energetic bandwidth point of view. Mm. So. Um, so yeah, it's do it's doable, and I like I like doing them, but I have to do them in kind of small doses. I do a lot of one shot streams. You'll find me doing that quite a bit. Me too. Do you have your own channel, or do you stream with uh, communities? I usually go into various communities to do it. I haven't really built up a stream audience just because it's not something I do consistently. Yeah. Mm. I probably should do it more consistently. Well, we got a channel for you. We, we have a channel. <laughs> just saying. And we're yeah, playing your game. One shot, Sunday, Sunday. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of, do you have a favorite uh, scenario from this book to run? Because <laughs> uh, I can't decide. Um, yeah, the uh, the small world one. Oh, um, the widow widow world. Yeah, what a widow world is <laughs> great, that's... and that's the one I usually will run. Just out of the, whenever I run it for somebody who hasn't played it, that's the one I usually run. Got to be honest, that was the one that I read the title and I was like, nope. Uh, <laughs> so that. Because that I went to Disney World as a kid, and even as a child, Small World scared the fuck out of me. 
Oh yeah, it's the scariest place. Terrifying. Now, now imagine with no music as they're still doing their gestures. Oh god, is that what's in? Is that what's in this? Yeah. Oh, god. Okay, Lydia. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, how do we bet? How do you describe Small Small World? Is a ride at Disney World that has been there since I think the park opened in the fifties. Probably, if not the sixties. Yeah, and it's um, just a bunch of small animatronic puppets. Like it's like a it's like a um. Think like a think like a tunnel of love type thing. Like you're just going on like a boat through like a little. Well, that was that Saturday Night Live sketch was about. Probably. Was there a, was there one on Saturday Night Live? Yeah, with Justin Timberlake, where one of the do- like they're super happy, like the Mary Poppins things and playing yeah, music yeah. and do the thing, and then one of them gets murdered. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's um and it's it's done by geography then, so there's all these really terrible uh, stereotypes. Yeah, probably very offensive. Uh, I don't remember what like, it looks there like. A, but... There's a Scottish hill with like the oh, yeah. the with plaid. It's not even a tartan, and like and then there's like you know a billy goat and a guy with a bagpipe. I mean, they just went all out with all <laughs> of the have, stereotypes. We do have wild goats. <laughs> they knew three things about Scotland, and they put all of them in the ride. The wild goats are new. People usually go with sheep, but that's Wales. And skull on TV. Oh, it might have been a sheep. Uh, maybe I'm misidentifying. It. If it's a sheep, then oh, that's also fair, I guess. Yeah, it's so it's it's bad. It, and you go through each of the continents uh, and seeing stereo bad stereotype after bad stereotype, and the same song plays over and over and over and over, oh. but in different languages. You know. And for some oh. reason, it's still fucking there. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Why. It's 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 such a. I get. They'll probably never get rid of it because it's like it's kind of an iconic like meme. Um. Wait, as I as I say that, I look it up, and it's I found a news story about how it's going to be replaced. <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah. <laughs> with End a of ta- an era. With a tangled theme ride, apparently. Uh, everything has to be branded now. Yeah, yeah, but it's like you one know? of the OG like Disney rides. It's it's legendary, but it's also kind of legendary for how bad it is. And, and the like, animatronic I, dolls are just scary. They're terrifying. Yeah. The animatronic dolls. So I'm not surprised. And the the description that Christopher just gave of imagining it without the music, but they're still doing it, that's horrifying <laughs> to me. Yeah. It's uh, a great scenario. Which feature, it. yeah, I mean, this the heading of this paragraph is Widow Possessed Dolls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm probably going to do this. Pirates of the Caribbean, but, uh, which is basically the same principle. I will probably just have to play a random German person with a super Germanic accent who's never been to a Disney theme park and does not understand the concept, because that will just be me. That would well, be great. What do you mean this is a place where you're supposed to be happy? I don't understand. <laughs> but that's the kind of us, happiness. This is not how this works. <laughs> why are these little puppets looking at me like that? And why are they wearing Lederhosen? <laughs> they do in that ride. They do! Of course they fucking do. Of course they do. <laughs> See, this is the this is the wrong. You're not supposed to wear lederhosen without. You need the socks and the boots. You can't just wear sneakers. And... <laughs> I have been scary. trying to get another product out uh, where it kind of downstream, but I need to wait till I update the rules a bit. I want to do um, Happiest Apocalypse at the Renaissance Fair. And I want to do Happiest Apocalypse at Jurassic and Park. Went to heaven. <laughs> I've got plans. I just. I need more time. I need more time. I'm clipping this. Can I. Uh, hell, um, let me do something. <laughs> it's so that's such a great idea. Oh my god, horror! Why didn't I? Why aren't we funding this? Well, we should. <laughs> H- horror Renfair, uh, miserable horror. That's the way I would describe Happiest Apocalypse. It's more. It's not just. It's horror. I mean, it's as horrible as you. It, Happiest Apocalypse is as horror as you want it to be, but it can also just be, just basically just really cynical i guess <laughs> the other sure way. right silly yeah, cynical sardonic because you can play the park people that work there and they're just feeding the beast and yeah. they have to clock in you know and then passively doing so it, that definitely happens in that game yeah it doesn't have to be um this like hell mouth uh type place but it can be um yeah. or you could just play it as kind of a yeah you, you can choose to play happy apocalypse as just sort of a yeah fuck capitalism sort of uh <laughs> type of type of gig um where you just make fun of how, you know, cheesy and almost sinister that that is. Um, but yeah, that would trans that translates really well to the Renfair setting. That's a really good idea. 
Have you written Dinos any of that? Dinosaur yet? Park. Uh, I've started. I mean, I just it's a question of time and the pipeline, but yeah, it's coming. Once uh, at one point, That's at one point good. we'll have that. That's really good. I'm so here for that. And yeah, Dinosaur Park too. That's yeah. Like... I also want to do me. Neverland and Alice in Wonderland too. Oh. As long as as you can play shirtless Jeff Goldblum and mm. Dinosaur Park, I'm happy. That could that. be its own archetype. Yes, please. Jeff Goldblum is its own archetype. Yeah, that's yeah. a playbook. Shirtless right. Jeff Goldblum specifically. <laughs> You get you get your option of Jeff Goldblum or shirtless Jeff Goldblum. That could be a whole game, really. Sure. The various Jeff Goldblum roles he plays in films. As it's what do you mean various? It's Jeff yeah, Goldblum. It was, no, it's, just, it's just Jeff Goldblum dressed up as other things. Just, no, it's the only difference, Lydia, is whether or not he's wearing a shirt. There are exactly two kinds of Jeff Goldblum. There's, but there's different. Okay, Jeff Goldblum is Jeff Goldblum in anything he does, right? Yeah. So totally. is Christopher Walken. So is mm-hmm. Sean Connery. Mm-hmm. So if the various playbooks are the various actors, and you just have to put them in different scenarios, but they're still always that person, we will run into a lot of copyright and yes, <laughs> and, fa- issues, and some false but, light lawsuits. <laughs> but <laughs> possible sound, libel. Eh. I don't know. Mm, maybe not. You know, it is satire. But remember, satire is a defense, not a you know. Cool. You yeah, Disney you gotta get sued first. Standing, so. <laughs> we, uh, yeah, I mean, Al, yeah, you got brass balls. You took on Disney, so <laughs> you risk the you risk the possible hammer of the mouse. So that's, eh. I don't know, man. I would, I would probably lift the platform of the game pretty high. So true story. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and sue me. It'll just make me sell more books. So um, I'll just change the name of it. That was Anna and I ran into that problem when we were trying to think of the name. We're working on a game that involves. Um, we're kind of game that involves very stereotypical types of, um, like, meta narrative, um, stereotype, archetype, whatever's of uh, heroes and fantasy stories, and we were trying to get the one that's just like the hero that inevitably will boldly sacrifice themselves and die for everybody, and it's just like it's the Sean Bean. Like we just kept getting the Sean Bean. <laughs> it might. That playbook might end up just be called being called the Sean Bean in the end, which yeah, just spell it wrong. Yeah, yeah there John you go. Bean. <laughs> just make it John Bean. The John Bean. <laughs> John Ben, got it. I think Bean is 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 universal enough. I think Sean Bean would be behind that and would fund it. Sean Being, I like that. Thank you, Funky B. I appreciate that, Sean Being. Right on. <laughs> I do like this idea though. Amazing. Get the actors who just play themselves in things, and use that as playbooks. So the Jeff Goldblum, the Sean Connery. That's hilarious. What was the other one you had? I gotta write these down. Christopher Walken. Christopher Walken, hundred percent. Hmm. Yeah. Now we're thinking of others that we. Yeah. Now that yeah, this is how games are boring. Everybody, this is what happens. This is how it happens. Yeah. This, yeah, this we're just having this moment of this doesn't exist. Yeah. There's a mar- Will Smith. Will Smith. Yeah. Will Smith. 100. <laughs> percent yeah. One of your moves is called Woo. Hundred <laughs> percent. <laughs> uh... Yes. Thank you, Funky B. This is why we love you. Uh, hey. Coming to Kickstarter next year. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. I, I, you know, I'd like to see it. <laughs> I'd back that. It. Yeah. Germans t- have better theme parks, do they? Sorry, I'm just reading up chat. Good going. Germans have better theme parks? Do do they? Uh, the Germans are not known for their fun loving theme parks, are they? <laughs> and now we all have to put the hands up as we go around the corner of the looping. Their theme think, parks are just Doesn't Germany have some of the, the better roller coasters? Like they're not afraid of fear. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe. They're, they're not afraid, afraid of fear. Anything. They're not There's, afraid I, of fear. They do not fear fear itself. Staple is that thing uh, we call it a takata. It's 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 where you sit down and then you get spun in a circle like a fucking washing machine and then up and down, up and down. It is I like people have constantly come away with broken bones and lots and lots of bruises, but they keep going. That was the staple of any of the um, kind of Oktoberfest, but they're usually in Austria they're usually actually in spring so it's yeah it's always that shooting gallery and those uh cars bumper cars that that's all Germany does for theme parks no that's what I know for Austria we have 
We have in Vienna. Oh. We have the old one of the oldest theme parks in the world, the Plaza, which has. St I'm going back to tour guide. Why are you doing this to me? Stop it! <laughs> Bullying you with knowledge. Europa Park. Europa Park. Funky B says. I don't know. Huh. I haven't heard of it. Hmm. But the yeah, character idea you had, definitely do that. The, <laughs> the German who doesn't understand why this is supposed to be fun. I, I will. It's, it's yeah. now. I mean, I will have to be Austrian because. Uh... That, that character will survive, too, because it's all the, uh, the giddy American tourists. They're like, ah! <laughs> Hired has come to life and is attacking me. And, you know, the Austrian will be like, of course it has. Yeah. yeah. I paid for this? Yeah. What is this bullshit? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so oh, here for boy. this. I'll be back. Oh, you're getting out the Arnold voice again? It's the only thing that works when I say I'm doing an Austrian accent. When I do an actual Austrian accent, people are like, no, that's not Arnold enough. I would never... You're actually Austrian! You can, <laughs> you can have this! <laughs> Reclaim your accent! I... Don't let them take it from you and give it exclusively to the governor of California! <laughs> The funny for thing God's is, from part of Stand Austria, up for yourself. is known for having a shit accent it, for Austrians. Like it's literally called the bellowing. The That's bellowing what their dialect is. Yeah, they're bellowing, barking. His, his bellowing. accent, Schwarzenegger's accent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even in Austria, it's shit. Like you should not be beholden to sounding like a guy who apparently already has a shitty Austrian accent, who has also spent like forty years in the United States and has a weird Californian hybrid thing. Like. You don't have to sound like that, motherfucker. Don't let anyone are do we, this to you. You should we... be on that archetype list, by the way. Oh, the oh yes. yes. 100%. Yes. yes. <laughs> Where's my... Paltrow. Fuck, I'm getting out of oh, index me. card and writing this down. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Professional. But fuck Prof Gwyneth Paltrow, seriously. Do, Gwyneth Paltrow? I disagrees with you. I hate her so much. Is she one who plays herself? Yeah, I think you would call it kind that. Kind of, yeah. It's not that much range. But, I mean... <laughs> Colin's writing it down. <laughs> I, got it. I, like, I like this. In, in this version, the, the, the GM is called Meryl Streep because they just play <laughs> right. everyone else. <laughs> I am literally writing this down. <laughs> or Daniel Day-Lewis, yeah. Yeah. Deanna Day Lewis, yes, the Deanna Day Lewis. Meryl Street, that's the two GMs. Yeah, yep. <laughs> you have your option of. Yep. Oh, Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise. He does. Uh, I saw a whole article. I think it must have been from Cracked, about how well Tom Cruise sprints. Sprints. And so he's always shown sprinting in a movie. Oh. Like he has the perfect sprint. He finds a way to get that in. Every like film he, yeah, he, his, his his very fast run is the best in Hollywood. And so there's always a Tom Cruise running from something. <laughs> can you imagine uh, being an scene. actor, though, and that being your pitch? What kind yeah, of range he, do you have? Well, I can run. Yeah, and he can hold on to airplanes as they take off. So, I mean, there's something going on there. He does his own stunts, I believe. Yeah. Uh, he he actually did that crazy shit. I think it was an MI4 when he like had to sit on top of the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. <laughs> Yeah, he did that. Some men quite respect him, yeah. There was um, a really funny MTV movie, uh, music award or something, I don't know, one of these award shows, where Ben Stiller was playing Tom Cruise's stunt double on Mission Impossible 2. Mm. And the entire oh. thing was about how Ben Stiller didn't actually do any stunts. <laughs> I saw that if it's on YouTube, stuff. we should look it up. Mission Impossible 2 opens with that badass scene of him open face climbing the side yeah. of a mountain. Yeah. yeah. That's a good movie, actually. The Michelle Rodriguez, always the tough chick that's slightly dirtied up. Thank you. Thank you. Any more from always, chat? always butch coated as well. Always. Mm -hmm. I have Sean Bean, Will Smith, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sean Connery, Michelle Rodriguez. I feel like I'm forgetting what Christopher Walken. Yep. Smith, you got him. Gotta have Walken. Aren't Basically glad... everybody in Independence Day. I mean, just write down Independence. Oh, Day. Jeff, it started. I forgot the one. We started with Jeff Goldblum, and we <laughs> we forgot. Oh, Harvey Firestein is in Independence Day. <laughs> Amazing. I gotta call my mother. Jeff Hurst. Um, you know. <laughs> yep, I'm definitely writing down Harvey Firestein. Bill Pullman. Bill Pullman. How's he doing? I think he's doing well. He looks good. You know. I remember he was in the. I made the mistake of going to see Mission Impossible or Mission Impossible uh, Independence Day two in theaters. Um, which was just the biggest pile of shit I've ever seen in my entire life. But there's like, Bill Pullman is like, in that movie, 
is the ex-president who's, like, living in a cabin in the woods, like, with a big fucking beard and, like... And it just it just felt like they went... It just felt like the story of they went and found the real Bill Pullman, who just hasn't been seen <laughs> since 96. And it's just, like, living like the Unabomber in the middle of the forest His somewhere. Flashlight lands on him. Bill? <laughs> Bill, is that you? What year is it? <laughs> it look, they look like they just pulled Saddam Hussein out of a hole in the ground. <laughs> like, oh it was God. bad. <laughs> Ooh, Chris Pratt is a Chris yeah, Pratt. Yeah, always the sort I like of him, though. lovable asshole. Have you ever heard the Chris Pratt paradox? It's a mm-hmm. documented phenomenon. The Chris Pratt paradox is that the hotter Chris Pratt gets, the less hot he gets. <laughs> he was somehow cuter when he was like chubby and on Parks and Rec back in the day, but like the more buff he's gotten, somehow it's like working in the opposite direction. I don't know what it is. I haven't heard of that one. Yeah. Thank you for that one, Funky B. I wrote that one down. Aren't you glad you came on the show to talk about your projects and game development? I told you I was going to bring the tangents. You brought I you. This I was is... going to bring the sidebars and the tangents, and here we are. And the nonsense, and we leaned I into have delivered. it. delivered. And you did deliver in spades. I mean, look at this index card I have. Oh, you can't <laughs> this see far, it the lighting... This got farther away from us than even Trooper could manage, which is, I, I don't impressive. know if you know Trooper SGP, but this is, uh, that's an accomplishment. I feel like there should be an award for biggest tangent. Yeah. Chat, yeah, I've got Sean Bean, Will Smith, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sean Connery, Michelle Rodriguez, Christopher Walken, Jeff Goldblum, Harvey Firestein, and Chris Pratt. If you have anything else, please drop it in chat. This game is happening now, and it's not it's out of we my hands. Need, we need more diversity in that cast. Get on it. That is true, yeah. Yeah, we only even have we only have one woman in this entire thing. Help me out. <laughs> Kathleen Turner. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, she's different and you know. The different Michael Douglas movies that she was in with. Yeah. Wesley Snipes. Funky B, if you think Wesley Snipes always plays the same character, you clearly no. haven't seen Too Wong Fu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Samuel L. Jackson plays a Samuel L. Jackson. That is fair, yeah. The playbook yeah. is just called Motherfucker. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, That's well, fair. Who's, who's just, do we have the sort of rom-com person? Jennifer Aniston? Matthew McConaughey from between 1999 and 2011. Yeah, had to specify. <laughs> he, he got better after his, that. There was a McConaughey song. his break, yeah. right? <laughs> Dallas oh, Buyers Club happened. Everything got better. Yeah. The Zoe Deschanel quirky. Oh, yes. Getting quirky with Zoe Deschanel. Thank you. Very good. I want... Uh, my, my dream film is... Uh, anything with Zoe Deschanel is a serial killer. Just because it's so opposite of her whole thing. I want that to happen. That would be good. Yeah. It's like when... Uh, what was that movie? Oh, One Hour Photo with Robin yeah, Williams? Yeah, right. Robin Williams I showed us his film. range. Yeah. That yeah, that, that broke my Robin Williams image mm. heavily. Yeah. That was good. Emma Stone plays Emma Stone. Eh, eh. It's not meme enough for me. Sigourney Weaver, do you agree with that? Oh, let me think about that. No. Just yeah, look stuff. at Ghostbusters versus Alien. Yeah. Completely different characters. Yeah. And I also just love her too much. Jennifer Lopez. Mm. I watched hey, enough. Would you, be, would you even classify her as an actor, though? Oh, that, yeah. Remember The Cell? Cool. She was really good in that. Yeah. The Cell? I, I, that is, is Rebel Wilson, favorite. unfortunately, you're right about that one. Yeah. Yeah. She's funny though. Generally, Tarzan Singh films are fucking amazing. I love them. Hmm. Wow. I'm already writing up stats. Look at that. Yeah, that's great. <coughs> this is gonna be the, 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 the big dice contest is can you keep uh, your your range limited? Oh yes. You Do know, not break the, typecasting. Yeah, so that you're gonna get like you're gonna get put into some you know really deep Netflix drama. Yeah. It's like, you know, 10 episode series. And so y- you can only be really good. The fail state is that you get put so, into like some Terrence Malick movie and like right. <laughs> things get really weird. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to protect your, uh, you know, your range. A wild Darren Aronofsky appears. And next thing you know, <laughs> next thing you know, you're in Mother. Everything's getting weird. <laughs> I hated that movie. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, I loved I love old Aronofsky's. My top three were Terry Gilliam, Aronofsky, and, and Chris Nolan. Just look at the films. Let's not look at the people that make them, because then I'd have to be sad. 
Yeah, there's that. Yeah. Anyway. So, role playing games. Ha ha oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. RPGs. it's what we do and what we talk about. Oh. Not films. Oh, Helen and Bottom Cardi. You're right. You're right. See, <laughs> Johnny Depp, please. Chad Johnny is Depp, delivering. Like, they really Ch are. Chad is not helping with keeping us on the track. Yo, You're not helping. This us. is what. Are you not entertained? <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is how we get you all waking up over there. All right. <laughs> appreciate it, though. Much appreciated. You have Vin Diesel, I guess. Oh, yeah. fuck that guy is... He was great in that. Oh, what was the uh, um, uh, the stockbroker movie? The um, Boiler Room. Boiler Room. That's one of his finest roles. And I don't know that many people know about that movie. But yeah, I didn't uh, know that existed. Yeah, it's just a great. Uh, it's this sham of a stock market kind of uh, brokerage that. Oh, oh, uh, oh. Um, oh there's I can't a... remember who else was in it. Funky Babaganoush is saving our bacon. Anyway, Johnny Depp played a pirate. Do you like pirate? tabletop games <laughs> 7c uh, is great yeah 7c is the only one i can think of um i have never City. really played oh we did play salt marsh it was kind of piratey yeah, yeah. a little piratey i never played salt marsh but yeah it's got some well, we had our bullshit. twiner game that was piratey but that's yeah totally. but we yeah made it i pirate. think space pirates are the best kind of pirates mm. it always ends up in firefly though doesn't it yeah, that's fine. It's not, not, it's not a bad thing. I'm working on... Um, oh, yeah, here's a good segue. I am working on a, a, a something that could work in that genre. Space Pirates? Uh, yeah, but with uh, with the Great American Novel chassis. Ooh. And I'm trying to bring in polyhedrals. So we'll see how this works. I cracked a big piece of the code just this week, so I'm very excited about it. Okay, so... That's all I can say. Well, knowing what I know about your process, what was what what were you looking for that you could not find? That made you want to make that game. I, I wanted to uh, play a fantasy heartbreaker without all of the damn rules. So I wanted uh, kind of like an OSR experience, but without you know arbitrary rules. I wanted it to be narrative driven. So, mm -hmm. kind of, oh, well, I'll use Great American Novel. But I, I, the problem is, I wanted to use polyhedral dice because otherwise, they're not playing a fantasy heartbreaker. <laughs> So um, that broke my system entirely, and I spent about a year trying to figure it out. But I figured it out. Just recently? Yeah. Actually, oh, just a couple nights ago. A couple I... minutes ago? Like, while a couple nights. A oh, couple <laughs> nights. I heard yeah, somewhere around the time, uh, somewhere around Zoe Deschanel, he just cracked the code. <laughs> I, figured <it> out. <laughs> I figured it out. Yeah. My God. Uh, Eureka. He had oh, that faraway look in his eye. Independent playtesters... Uh, you know, we're here. Yeah, I'm gonna finish writing up some stuff, and then this I'll is what we do. Pick you up on that. Yeah, we always love playing. Like any anyone, you've got fun new stuff you want us to, to try out. Especially, we'll throw it on stream and show it to people. Uh, we yeah. love doing that. Yeah. yeah, that'd be great. That being said, we are coming close to the two hour mark, like a minute. Mm. Um, and if there is no more questions in chat, I feel like we should bring this absolute madness towards a well-deserved end. Um, if, <laughs> if there's, of course, any more actors that chat can come up with, uh, you're, you're welcome to tweet them at us. Just randomly, random, random caps-locked actor names in the middle of the night. That's going to be good. I'm going to bolt up 90 degrees at 4 o'clock in the morning. Tori Spelling! <laughs> Tori Spelling! Oh my, I forgot she existed. So did Hollywood. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry. What did you get for fixing your nose? I never cared that much for 90210. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, but yes, Lydia's right. We should uh, wind this madness down. But uh, before um, before we go, Christopher, do you have any uh, plugs you'd like to toss out to our lovely audience? Well, yes. And and before you do that, we forgot about our our, our oh yes staple of we have only um, one recurring segment on the whole show and we forgot to one do it. Thing, Colin. <laughs> um, what we usually ask uh, GMs and game developers if if there is one thing that you could just telepathically transplant into the brains of all GMs out there, the ones that play your games in particular, but any and all GMs, what is your plea to the GMs of this world to Keep doing, stop doing, start doing. Just the one thing that keeps you inside. Uh, care about the story. 
simple and to the point, and I can sign that wholeheartedly. Give a damn. That means, that means you care about the characters too. And um, if you are in any sort of adversarial role, it's just because you want to see the characters grow. Mm, mm. Yeah, I mean, it's the um, Kurt Vonnegut thing. It's the um, be a sadist in the sense of you have to make horrible things happen to them to find out what they're made of. But yeah. not just for its own sake. There's an end right. in mind here. Yeah. Right. That ties up quite nicely. That is that is a nice bow on top of two hours of insanity. So, yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, like I was saying, plug stuff. What do you got? Uh, the, the biggest thing going on right now is a Kickstarter for Temples and Tombs, mm -hmm. which is uh, adventure pulp in the style of The Mummy, 1999, oh, yeah. and, um, and Raiders of the Lost Ark and all of our favorite pulp movies. Uh, and it is uh, Year Zero, which is Free League system. So it's uh, pretty familiar for those of you who played Tales from the Loop in those games. Uh, that is, I think there's only like 10 days left. And it's it's pa well past the goal. In fact, it went w way far bigger than, than uh, Gallant Knight and I anticipated. So it's just really cool. I'm adding more content as a result. Um, and it's it's basically done. So if you back now, you actually get the beta rules and you can take it at the table right away. So really nice. cool. Let's see, we have... Looking it up right now. Ten days to go, and it's not loading. I'm trying to. Uh, yeah, you're. Well, you doubled your funding goal. Yeah, and we just needed to raise enough money so Gallant Knight could print the books, and now, um, and now we can print the books. So that's great. Uh, so we're, we're we're going to turn around the digital version within a month, the latest, and uh, the print will come as soon as the world figures itself out. Oh boy. No idea. That depends <laughs> on shipping, on the post up, on VAT, apparently. Um, yeah. All these fun things. Whatever that in. is. Yeah, right. Well, go back it, folks. Uh, the link is there in the uh, the chat command there. You see at the bottom the second link. The first one is Christopher's website, Christopher.world. And then the second one there is the link to the Kickstarter for Temples and Tombs. So go check it out. You got 10 days left to back it. Sure, it's already met its funding goal, but what the hell? Keep it going. Get yourself a copy. Yeah. Um, if it gets up it. to 15,000, we're going to um, add some more, even more content than, yeah. than not expected. So um, I, it might happen. I don't know. I'd be, I, I'm shocked because I didn't expect it to go this far. So thank you, everybody who backed. Yeah. And you've got, um, yeah, you, you've, uh, you've they've got, yeah, you got some stretch gold content in front of you. So get on it, folks. Go play it. I'm going to play it. Get the man writing. I think I've already backed it. If I haven't, I'll go do that in a minute. I've, I've lost track of all the fucking Kickstarters, so I don't... I do the same thing. I don't remember if I backed I it or not. I was I worried say... about the one ring there for a while, but good thing it funded. Whew. Oh, boy. Cool. That one's... I, I smell bullshit on that one. <laughs> like, the funding goal was oh, like... Oh, was that... Oh, that... that was it was like $11,000. The funding goal was like $11,000. <laughs> I'm like, the, the IP costs more than that. How the fuck... There's no way that that is the, a they, they serious knew. funding goal. They knew. Yeah, they. I felt like they just wanted to have the funded in four minutes or whatever thing on there. They wanted that stamp. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a bunch of developers we'll never have on the show now. Anyway. Um, <laughs> woof. Anyhow. Yeah, no, totally marketing strategy. Okay, well, Christopher, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a delight. Thank you for indulging our madness. Yeah, um, that was fun. Yeah, man. And we look forward to playing all the beautiful things you're creating in uh, months and years to come. Uh, yeah. Or in weeks to come, actually. Tell, tell me the stories. I always love hearing the game stories. Oh, yeah. We will. Yeah. It'll, I, you'll get a full detailed write-up. Great. <laughs> all right. We'll see you later, Christopher. Thank you. Bye. I have so many things to think about now. Is it mostly Vin Diesel? No. He has no hair. I'm not... Uh, that's the yeah rude mm. <laughs> <laughs> on that note uh <laughs> how, how are we how are we getting our professional reputation back from this we we had one uh, fair enough mm. <sighs> but i had a lot of fun I'm, what's I'm a dead may never die <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'm looking forward to how Great American Witch connects as well and continues. Um, it's it's just two episodes in, and every Monday um, at six 
no, what what is it? 5 p.m. EST time zones. 5 p.m. EST over on Weave the Tail. We are actually playing the game or one of the games we talked about here today. If you want to check that out at some point, it's on YouTube as well. For for um, first two episodes are on. Uh, just gonna drop a link in chat. Um, and Chris every now and then stops by, says hi, and of course if you want to follow him, go check out his uh, Twitter and the link there as well if you want to there, there, there. <laughs> if you have any other questions um, for me or want to see what else I'm doing then check out Half Hour's Hermit on Twitter but that's all my energy for tonight and all I'm my bullshit for bent. tonight as well <laughs> um, yeah well uh, thank you all for watching. Thank you for Christopher being here. I'm Colin at Colinomicon. This is my channel. You've been watching it, and I love you very much for doing that. Uh, you too, Golden Lasso Girl. Thank you. Uh, please give me a follow on Twitter if you don't already, which is also at Colinomicon. Um, as far as other stuff I do, we uh, here on this channel every Sunday we have a one shot. Uh, it's a different game, different system, different cast every Sunday at 7 p.m. This weekend's one-shot is going to be a game of Blades in the Dark with guest GM Valdrianth, but we are doing uh, a Weird West hack of Blades in the Dark called Fistful of Darkness. Um, we're going to do some weird Forged in the Dark Eldritch Cowboy bullshit, and it's going to be great. Uh, also, new thing that just kind of happened really fast on this channel, we now have a uh, Monster of the Week show that came together in like three days. And uh, every Monday night now from 7 to probably between 10 and 11. Who knows? I'm GMing it, so it's never not going to fucking end on Midnight. time. Yeah. <laughs> shut up. You're right, but shut up. <laughs> um, I'm personally attacked accurately. Oh, uh, yeah, please. Uh, that was fully the intention, I hope. Yeah. yeah. You know. No. Nope. It's an accurate barb. Uh, uh, we have a new show called uh, Monster of the Week Act 3. Uh, Act standing here for abnormality containment team three aren't i clever um it's laced with theater puns and it involves uh a secret city underneath denver full of monsters uh and yeah it's gonna be really weird and cool and uh that's got myself gming it with uh wally 132 our friend wally uh savvy seaworth of good game nights and um and uh the little, 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 Anna. Anna, Christ. Every time. Doesn't matter how Every small time. the cast always is. Always the last one. Always. Ugh. It's the smallest cast of any show I do, and I can't remember three fucking she'll, people. She'll forgive you, because she's that nice of a person. It does sound neat, doesn't it, Funky B? Go check it out, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, on this channel. We had our Session Zero last week. It will be on YouTube tonight. So check out my YouTube, uh, and you can get caught up on what happened in there. That is the link to my YouTube. Uh, the only other thing is that um, uh, on Weave the Tale, every Monday from 6 to 9, I am GMing Black Void by Christopher Sevelton. I love that game. It's super fun. We're about to come up on episode 4. Watch it. And if you enjoyed the uh, conversation we have with Christopher tonight and you want to see some of this man's work in action, watch The Great American Witch on Weave the Tale. And also come back here on April 4th, uh, Sunday, April 4th, when our weekly one-shot will be a one-shot of Happiest Apocalypse on Earth. And per christopher's recommendation uh the adventure will be a horrible version of small world <laughs> called whittle world oh my god i'm dreading the snap cam filter is you gonna dig out for that it's gonna be utterly horrific and you should watch it for that reason oh. yep um also i mentioned a moment ago our friend uh savvy seaworth and we're actually gonna go over and see her so please stick around we're gonna go raid over in to a goo goo game nights and say hello to our good friends over there good, 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 it's gg like gg good yeah i know i know, I know. Just... she explained this to me finally it took me months to realize that's what it was but yeah she did finally but i prefer to call it goo goo game nights um that is all we love you so much thank you all for watching and we will see you in two weeks uh for the next episode of gm postmortem uh where our next guest will the Don. Don, Donathan Fry. Oh, great. We were supposed to have him in January, but he's on a loose bench, so um, <laughs> hopefully it will work out this time. If not, oh. we'll hunt him down in time to chair and interview him that way. Mm -hmm. yeah, Christopher got off light. Anyway, 
Good night, everybody. See y'all uh, this Sunday. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.